We all know the dangers. We all know the potential catastrophe. We now have to do something about it. Understanding climate change and the science behind it can help open doors. Um, kids sort of see this as a challenge of the future, and I think it might uh, sort of encourage more kids to get into science to take on the challenge. One of the greatest challenges that we face, and our younger generation are going to have to deal with this, finding solutions. I'm an optimist, but I also firmly believe science and technology are at the heart of our solutions. Hello, I'm Julia Knights, Deputy Director of the Science Museum, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's latest edition in our Climate Talk series. Launched in 2021 in the run-up to the COP26 in Glasgow, the Science Museum Group's Climate Talks have connected world leaders, scientists, economists and campaigners to discuss how to debate the solutions to tackling dangerous global climate change. We've welcomed some great speakers to this series, including conservationist Jane Goodall, former US presidential climate envoy John Kerry, astronauts Helen Sharman and Tim Peake, space scientist Maggie Adger and Pocock, and the late James Lovelock, to name but a few. Throughout the nearly four billion year history of life on Earth, there have been five mass extinction events. Yet as global wildlife populations continue to decrease at a devastating rate, as a direct result of habitat loss and climate change, with well over one million animal, plant and insect species now threatened with extinction, life on our planet is unfortunately on course for the sixth one very soon. On tonight's Climate Talk, ahead of the most important international biodiversity conference this year, the UN Biodiversity COP in Colombia, we've assembled a fantastic panel of experts to debate the causes of this sixth mass extinction and the solutions to saving our wildlife before it's too late. So let's meet our chair for this evening, a brilliant presenter who has chaired countless programmes in the sphere of climate and sustainability, Casa Allen. Casa, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia, Deputy Director of the Science Museum, and welcome to tonight's Climate Talk. Now, as Dr. Knights just mentioned, five mass extinction events have already occurred on our planet, with the most recent one being caused by the infamous asteroid that is believed to have wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. But due to global climate change, habitat loss, urbanization, and intensive agriculture, global wildlife populations have fallen by almost 70% in the past 50 years alone, with many believing we are witnessing a sixth mass extinction. So in tonight's climate talk, our experts will shine a light on the impacts of climate change on wildlife loss and focus on some of the solutions to curbing biodiversity loss. Uh, Julia Knight mentioned some fantastic uh, experts that we've had on the panel and we have some more fantastic uh, guests tonight so let's meet them for you. In no particular order, a warm welcome to Dr. Asha DeVos. Dr. Asha DeVos is an internationally acclaimed Sri Lankan marine biologist, ocean educator, pioneer of long-term blue whale research within the northern Indian Ocean, author and strong advocate for diversity and equity in marine conservation. She's the founder of Oceans Well, which is an adjunct research fellow at the University of Western Australia and is a scientific advisor to the UN Secretary General as well. We are blessed to have you with us. Thank you so much. Also very blessed to have Professor Johan Dutois, the Director of Science at Zoological Society of London. Also welcome to Professor Anne Sverda Tigerson, a Professor of Conservation Biology at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and author of Tapestries of Life and Extraordinary Insects, Weird, Wonderful, Indispensable, The Ones Who Run Our World. What a title that is, certainly would make me pick it up. Um, and finally, welcome to Dr. Gerardo Ceballos, Senior Researcher Specialising in Endangered Species and Ecological Sustainability 
at the Institute of Ecology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. So pleased to have all four of you with me tonight to, to explain what is happening right now and also to answer some audience questions as well that we have had in. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we're going to start with you, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Gerardo. Um, it's lovely to have you with us. Um, and, and I suppose that what I want to ask you to explain for me, but also anybody who might be curious, is what actually qualifies as a mass extinction event? And after you explain that, if you could maybe enlighten us with some of the indicators that we may be entering into another one, that would be great as well. Perfect. Well, that's a great question. Thank you very much for the panel and for the inviting me to, to talk to you tonight. Well, uh, mass extinction uh, evolution works basically as uh, uh, the process of extinctions and speciation. The species are becoming extinct and species are uh, uh, being created by evolutionary processes. In normal times, uh, the rates of extinction are lower than the rates of speciation, indicating that the number of species is increasing. In this particular moment, the number of species in the planet is the highest ever recorded. I mean, uh, an extinction, that, but uh, in the last 550 million years, there has been five uh, events where the uh, extinction rate becomes much more elevated. And a mass extinction qualifies when basically is geologically very, very fast, uh, uh, millions, few, few thousands uh, of years, a few million years, and then it destroys 70% or more of the biodiversity of the planet, see? And it has been caused by catastrophic events like the impact of the meteorite uh, that vaporizes the, uh, and the, they become extinct all the dinosaurs. So that's what is a, was a, a mass extinction. We have seen five in the last 550 million years, and we are witnessing now the sixth mass extinction. And what makes you uh, what makes you say that? Are there any signs, any indicators that this might be a sixth? Well, I mean, now the, the science has been uh, uh, pretty clear that we are losing a species much, much faster than uh, uh, a species being evolving. And let's, let's think, I mean, let's go back a little bit. In 2015, I published a paper where we have the fortune to be able to uh, uh, have to count with the extinction rates of mammals in the last few million years. Anthony Barnowski from the University of Berkeley uh, produces this uh, very fine study where they were able to see what were the uh, extinction rates in the pre previous million years. And then with that data, we compare those extinction rates to the uh, extinction rates in the last 500 uh, years, in the last uh, decade. And we find out that the vertebrates, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes that become extinct in the last 100 years, who have, who have taken 10,000 years at least to become extinct. And uh, um, after we published this paper, there were papers in insects, in all kinds of plants and fungi, even microorganisms, and all those studies are showing up that were losing a species much, much faster than in the previous uh, uh, million years. And that's what it counts as a, a mass extinction. I think there is a, a, I would say that basically all scientists working on these issues do un understand and not believe, I mean, the data shows that we are in, uh, have entered the six mass extinction. And uh, that's, uh, uh, we will be the only first, uh, the only mass extinction that we will see as humans. And it will be the only mass extinction caused by us. It's a really powerful sentiment there. And that is something that I will reiterate with the, with the other panelists uh, later on as well. But I want to know what you believe are the main factors behind this huge loss of mammals, birds, insects, plants, fungi, like you said? Well, the, the, the first point, the first thing to point out is like this mass extinction has been uh, created by humans. Uh, but what is interesting to see is that in the five, five, last 500 years, and especially in, in, the, in the last uh, century, we have, seen, we have seen this massive increase in extinctions. And this is obviously coincide with the numbers of uh, people in the planet. There is no doubt that the humans are causing this problem. And basically the ultimate uh, uh, causes are 
human uh, population growth. We are too many. We are every every year there are 100 million people more in the planet. There will be one billion people more in this planet in one decade. Second, our consumption, especially for the countries more affluent on the people like us more affluent, the our consumption patterns are uh, causing this. And finally, the technologies, faulty technologies like using carbon or uh, oil or anything. Um, those three major uh, underlying cause, uh, factors, what are causing us, first of all, the destructions of uh, major ecosystems in the planet, both in land and in the marine. Second, there will be the uh, overkilling and overexploitation. The, we are uh, fishing too many uh, fishes from the, 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 the uh, uh, seas. We are uh, killing too many animals for uh, uh, food. We are uh, the illegal trade, for instance, has become an increasingly bad problem. We are losing literally hundreds of millions of animals every year to the illegal trade. And then we have pollution, uh, plastics, and then toxification. All the all the more than one hundred thousand uh, chemicals going to the to, to the to the environment, and finally introduce species, exotic species like the ones who have wiped out uh, massive uh, numbers of animals in Australia, for example, foxes, rats, dogs, etc. And finally, diseases, new diseases, and introduced diseases that are wiping out our species. So, habitat fragmentation, exploitation of exploitation, illegal trade, pollution invasive species, diseases, and so on. All those are the major causes of extinction. You've made it very clear that 66 million years ago, there was this asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. The asteroid this time is humans and the behavior that we are carrying out. So thank you very much for explaining that. And um, are there though, very quickly, what, uh, are there any signs that the trends in biodiversity loss are being reversed anywhere? Well, not, not reverse. I mean, fortunately, there are some cases where we have been able to uh, mitigate the problem and there are some species recovering, some species on the brink of extinction, like, uh, 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 let's say, wolves in Mexico have been recovering, they will become extinct in Mexico, they are being reintroduced, or uh, we have seen in Africa, in Africa, some species are uh, being a rebound from extinction, but it's not reverse. I mean, unfortunately, our actions, we, some, some, at the beginning in the videos, they say that there's one million species on the brink of extinction. The number of species at the brink of extinction or in danger of extinction is much, much larger because we know only two million species has been described, but we estimate that there are probably 15 million of 50 million species uh, in the planet. So most of the biodiversity of the planet is unknown. We know mm -hmm. very little fraction. Of that very little fraction, half of the uh, species that we know are estimated to be, to be uh, at risk of extinction. But really, we know so little about biodiversity that the numbers must be much, much higher. So Thank there is no so reverse much. of the problem. So basically, we're having some successes, but uh, the problem is big. Thank you so much for your time, Gerardo. Look forward to uh, speaking to you a little bit more about this in a moment. But right now, let's turn our attention to Johan Dutois. Uh, Johan, appreciate your patience. I, I know that you're particularly concerned by the subtle knock-on effects of climate change on wildlife. What do you mean by this? When most people talk about climate change, we talk about you know the impact that it's having on the oceans, on on you know on, on the environment around us, but what are those subtle knock-on effects of climate change to wildlife and, and how they are acting, they're behaving? Thank you. So as has just been explained, there, there are multiple human effects, human forcing pressures on biodiversity of which climate change is one. And the main effect is global warming. But it's really important to understand that it's not necessarily the immediate effects of climate change alone, such as heat waves, that cause populations of wildlife to decline, but it's multiple interacting effects that combine to reduce the fitness, and the fitness is the reproductive success of individuals living in wild populations. And, you know, obviously, certainly for species with very specific and limited habitats, some effects of climate change, such as frequent and severe hurricanes, for example, can be devastating. But more generally, the effects propagate through by forced changes in activity patterns, for example, leading to ex increased exposure to predation, changes in distribution of pathogen vectors, 
that expose naive species and populations to disease, changes in vegetation and snow cover that influence nutrition and predation, predation risk. And these are all accumulating and slowly affecting individuals within populations. Just as an example, if you were to consider an insectivorous bird um, that's native to a, a, a semi-desert ecosystem, increased frequency and severity of hot days means those birds have got to shelter for longer during the heat of the day in the canopy of a tree to stay in the shade, which means that they can't go out and forage and provision their chicks. Then what they have to do is they have to push their foraging time to later in the day when it's cooler, which means in order to feed their chicks successfully, they've still got to put in that amount of foraging time somehow. And so that pushes them into dusk, into the dark periods of, of, of the late afternoon. And now all of a sudden they're exposed to the threat of predators like owls who now see them returning to their nest and provisioning their chicks. The owls can now attack the nest and take chicks. So the adult bird is still alive, is still fine, but it's losing the reproductive success through each clutch of, of chicks, of eggs that it hatches. And that cumulative effect over time results in a population declining and disappearing. And so these are the subtle effects that one has to untangle um, that accumulate. Thank you so much for giving us that example. That is exactly um, what, what I mean in that sense about the fact that actually it's, it, it's one of those where you know, we, we're not exactly sure on, on those subtle effects, but for yourself and those custodians, you're able to tell us and actually the whole behavior pattern has shifted as a result and that is exposing them and in different ways. I appreciate that. So tell us then, the Zoological Society or ZSL, which is the custodian of the world famous London Zoo, what role do zoos have then generally in conservation efforts and what conservation efforts currently underway at ZSL to protect species impacted by climate change? Well, properly managed zoos serve a vital function in wildlife conservation by inspiring visitors to contribute to conservation efforts and to educate people about biodiversity, to provide funding for research and conservation action in the wild as well is, 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 is extremely important. A lot of our research at ZSL is funded by visitors to the zoo paying as they go through the turnstiles. Also, zoos can maintain animals in living connections collections, even if they're extinct in the wild. Um, and the hope is to restore them and protect their natural habitat and enable those species to get back into the wild again. And uh, ZSL has an active program called Extinct in the Wild, involving many species, including corals, snails, fish, birds, and mammals, where we have individuals in our living collection that we are breeding. And then we are at the same time working on habitat remediation, and then working at trying to get these animals back in the wild again. Uh, I'll give you an example, um, an ex situ conservation program that's currently underway. Ex situ means out of the site at which the species naturally occurs. Um, and it's directly in response to climate change is the conservation of brain corals from the Chagos archipelago in the Indian Ocean. And this is led by colleagues at the Horniman Museum in London and ZSL is an active collaborator in this program. And these brain corals are extremely rare and disappearing. Um, and the work underway is to monitor their larval dispersal patterns through the ocean, to see where, how the currents move the larvae around, to identify cool water areas in the Indian Ocean, which are still suitable for coral growth and therefore for targeted conservation. And then intensive ex situ research is going on into spawning and potential cryopreservation, freezing of gametes and larvae with the hope of being able to transport these propagules and then to reintroduce species into areas where they've been wiped out due to warming events, after the warming event, wow. and possibly even moving corals in various life stages through assisted migration to new sites in the ocean where the conditions might now be suitable for that species. Incredible. Johan, thank you so much for explaining that. It's incredible ambition there that is going on. Um, we'll come back to you in a moment as well. Let's now head and speak to you, though, Anne. A huge focus of your work is on the rich diversity of insects, which are often overlooked, 
compared with larger, more eye-catching wildlife. But um, yeah, why don't you stick up for the the humble insect right now, if you don't mind? Why are they so important to nature's success as well as our own survival? Well, t- to start with, uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, for every one watching now, for every human being uh, alive on the planet right now, uh, there are 200 million insects. Um, so that means between one and ten quintillion insects are living, you know, shuffling, crawling, flying around uh, as we speak, which means they are uh, outnumbering the number of uh, sand grains um, on all the world's beaches. Um, Did I tell you I don't like creepy crawlies, by the way? <laughs> no, <laughs> they are super important because, no, you know, not only there are tons of them, but they also come in lots of different uh, versions or species. Um, even though, like it has been said already, there's a lot we don't know. Um, we have described about one million insect species. And to illustrate that, it means, you know, you could have an insect of the month calendar uh, featuring a new species every single month for more than 80,000 years. So. Yeah. That sort of gives you um, an idea. And when you then add that each one of these species, each one of these insect individuals uh, are intertwined, they have interactions with lots of other species, big and small. Um, And these interactions are, of course, the basis for all the goods and services that we uh, can enjoy from nature. So we need insects of course, for pollination, that's what everyone knows about, but also they are really important for decomposition and soil formation. They are super important as food for bigger animals, other animals. Uh, they disperse seeds. They are important to keep uh, other species in check, harmful species. Um, they help us in research that, and they serve to, to inspire us with, with their mm-hmm. solutions. So there's we so from, many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We heard from Johan there. He was just talking about the ambitious plans to to help. You know, when you know, with the change of the climate, to actually you know move certain species and actually create a new environment for them. Or so. I, I wonder what your thoughts are. Could any efforts to save one species? negatively actually impact the success of another species and then of course how do we prioritize certain species on their importance to the environment is there a ranking table almost yes i mean this is tricky i think Um, of course we know that there are certain keystone species out there uh, species with a disproportionately large uh, effect on its natural environment uh, relative to its amb- amb- abundance. Uh, and it seems logical that uh, those should get priority. But it's also a fact that, of course, we know a lot more about the bigger animals, the, the vertebrates. And the limited knowledge of the small hidden species Uh, insects, fungi, uh, microorganisms. Um, I think it's really easy that we overlook uh, keystone species in those taxa, in those groups. Mm -hmm. So whenever and wherever it is possible, I think um, we should strive to um, protect intact environments, intact habitats, if they are still there, um, or try to restore them as best as we can, exactly to make room for all these subtle interactions um, that are so important. Um, Again, I apologize for rushing you a little bit, but very quickly, what are some of those uh, pressures of climate change on insects? You know, clearly we know about it for, uh, you know, animals, um, you know, mammals, for example, and birds. And and Johan gave us a great example there of how climate change is impacting the behavior of birds. But when it comes to insects, um, are there any stress factors out there for them? Oh, yes. I mean, of course, a lot of the the same stress factors uh, are there. Um, uh, There's this expression that insects sort of suffer from death by a thousand cuts or Mm -hmm. a deadly cocktail, uh, which sort of mirrors what has been said already. Um, It is, of course, habitat loss and fragmentation, um, pollution of different kinds, uh, invasive species. And on top of that, climate change will come and... 
and add to the effect. Um, the point being that all of these play together. Um, the summed effect can really destabilize insect communities uh, and have sort of repercussions through the entire ecosystems because they are so numerous, because they have so many interactions with other species. Thank so you. it's not maybe so easy to see, but it's really, really an important part of uh, the ecosystems out there. Thank you so much. Right, let's uh, let's speak to Asha right now. Asha, um, you established the uh, non-profit Oceans Well, which is Sri Lanka's first marine conservation research and education uh, organization. Tell us about this charity it's, and its mission to preserve oceans and its wildlife, please. All right. Hi. Uh, well, good evening, everyone from Sri Lanka. Um, just so um, I established Oceans Well in 2017 because I noticed that there was sort of a, a big niche for marine con conservation research in the country, um, and particularly one that's tied up with education. So it's not just about producing the science, but also ensuring that that science is taken to the public and converted into policy, uh, uh, you know, documents that can actually help change policy. Uh, we are a marine conservation research and education organization, and our goal really is to nurture the next generation of diverse, as we call, ocean heroes. Um, and to continue to bring conservation research work. So again, mm -hmm. there the key thing is we identify very important marine conservation issues, particularly around the island, and there are many. Um, I mean, you know, just to say that in 2017 we established the first marine conservation research organization tells you a little bit about our interaction with the ocean space for the longest time, and the fact that there was very little in, uh, you know, sort of. Um, very little uh, regard or interaction with the ocean. Most people will do terrestrial research, but marine research is very few and far bet between. But we also look at the model where we're trying to train the next generation of ocean heroes, as we call it, because I think it's really important that we're ensuring that um, when we're trying to protect the world's largest ecosystem, we're also building the world's largest team. Um, and a lot of our work is about building locally so that we can ensure that countries, people within the country can actually uh, take forward the work and continue the work uh, rather than always having to depend on a model like a parachute model where you have people mm -hmm. coming in from outside doing work and leaving. So very, very local focus and very, very, with a strong belief that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Great. So tell, talk to me then. Thank you for telling us about your, your, your charity. Um, talking about the, the oceans now, what would you say, and marine wildlife, um, what are the most concerning impacts that climate change is having on marine wildlife? Yeah, the impacts are many uh, across the board, but there's, you know, you can think of some key impacts, for example, as ocean temperatures increase, uh, we have the impact of, you know, coral bleaching. Uh, we're going through a massive bleaching event right now, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit. But apart from that, we have impact of, uh, we have... Um, Can you just explain that for me now, very quickly, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. So what is coral bleaching? bleaching is, uh, absolutely. So coral bleaching is where you have, you know, the structure of the coral, the animal, and within it, they have, there are these little, uh, little algae that live within it. And when the temperature of, of the ocean increases a bit too much, that feels intolerable to the algae, they leave these structures, the coral structures. Um, and as they do so, they take the color with them because that's what causes the color. And therefore, we're left with this like a whitened structure. Now, that's all well and good. You can have this bleaching event and it is uh, reversible in many ways if conditions kind of go back to normal. But as you can see, the theme around the room is reminding people that impacts are not solitary. There's always like multiple impacts, multiple stresses that come together. So you might have the temperature into normal, but you might also have, um, you know, a, a whole bunch of nutrients coming off the land that is, are, you know, uh, problematic for the coral. So that means the coral can't recover. But the problem mm -hmm. with that is not just, you know, the fact that the coral structures decrease, uh, decline, but also these are spawning and nursery grounds for a lot of species. So that can have impacts on fisheries, which can have impacts on livelihoods. Um, if coral reefs deteriorate, there are dive, you know, there's diving industries that depend on these coral reefs, right? So you're going to go see, obviously, the knock-on impacts of that. So coral bleaching is something that always comes to mind. Um, and it's also a very, uh, you know, powerful image when you see the yeah. powerful coral and mm -hmm. then you see the white structure that 
kind of dying structures, um, which it's that visual really, element that really does make it bring it home for people, doesn't it? Also, yes, another thing yes. that is really you know visual: the ocean seagrass meadows, for example, they sequester carbon at an incredible rate, thirty-five times faster than tropical rainforests, um, and yet we're losing them globally at an alarming rate. What can be done to save them? I mean, all of it goes back to, you know, the multiple stresses. So, you know, in some places, seagrass meadows, it could be because of the extreme weather events that we're experiencing. They could be just being basically trawled up with uh, in fisheries. Um, it could be multiple things that's causing the destruction of these uh, seagrass meadows, lack of protection, really. So all of these areas, like, you know, historically, we've protected for the sake, like protected for the sake of protection, and shut out areas. But we're learning more and more that we can't just shut people out of areas because that's really not going to help. And so we're looking at how do we create spaces that are multiple use, right? So we're protecting a certain part of it, but also creating spaces for people's livelihoods to continue. Because, you know, as we rightly know human populations are growing and we need to kind of accommodate some of those needs. But I do want to go back to talking about the impacts of climate change on the marine environment. Um, and we talked about coral bleaching, which is that visual one, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of impacts that, we're, that are not visual. Right? And I think mm. those are in some ways the most problematic if you, because we're... If you can just give us one of those, that would be ideal because I'd like to bring yeah, everybody else absolutely. back in now. But yeah, if you can give us one, that would be fantastic. So right? if you think about, yeah, so you think about the base of every food chain is phytoplankton, right? These tiny microscopic plants that float on the ocean. So as the oceans are warming, we're losing more and more of those little plants, which, and they are one of the, you know, primary producers in our ocean. They help to produce about 50% of the oxygen in the atmosphere, a large part which is used in the ocean itself. But the problem is, if you have less of the, you know, the grass, so to speak, at the bottom of the food chain, you're going to have less things that eat that and less things that eat the other thing. So the chain, you have knock-on effects with maybe it can impact fisheries because there's less fish out there to be caught. Uh, you can have less whales because, you know, their food supply chain is also broken down. And so the knock-on effects of losing the base of the food chain are actually quite, quite mm -hmm. large. Thank you so much for explaining that. And it's been lovely to delve a little bit into all four of your work individually, just to get a little grasp of, of something that is effectively your life work. So appreciate you giving me five, six minutes just to sort of tell me all about it. But right now, I'd like to in, bring everybody back in just to have a discussion for about half an hour or so. And um, yeah, hopefully if there's something that you want to talk to each other about as well, that would be great. Uh, Hanada, I'm going to come back to you first of all. I mean, as Dr. Knights mentioned in her introduction, um, in little over two weeks' time, the 16th UN Biodiversity Conference, or COP16, will begin um, in Colombia, I believe, on the 21st of October. Um, that is one of the most biodiverse nations on Earth. What do you hope, um, actually, what do you also ex expect the conference to achieve? Well, uh, I am very skeptical about this COP and these conferences because we have seen that they have they basically don't get anywhere we we sign some countries sign some some of the uh, uh, agreements but nobody really is putting the money nobody putting the effort nobody supervising that this happened and what i think is happening mean, having COP and having this kind of of a, a convention is actually distracting us and it's giving us the hope that something is going on in the right direction, and that's not the case. So uh, I think it's good in the sense that we gather together and we discuss and so on, but I think it's not doing what it ha has to do. You'll give you mm -hmm. an example. For instance, recently, Global Conservation, that is an organization that does a really important job on pr protecting the last tropical forest on the planet, estimate that they need $250 million to save all the remaining tropical forests in this, in this planet. And uh, it's $250 million, it's nothing. But then we spend so much money in the COPs, flying so many people and so many executives and so many things. And we sign something that is not going, going nowhere. So I think we should, should, should change that. So my hopes for that is simply that it's calling attention to the problem, but I don't really think it's going to achieve anything else the, similar to what has happened in the last uh, since uh, 1992 in the Rio Cup. 
So yeah, I'm sorry you've been around that I'm far not too many. Yeah, you've been around for far too many cops to, um, to and become a bit cynical. But also, I saw Anne. You had a little wry smile when Gerardo said that. Is that an, an, an opinion that you also share? Yes, unfortunately, or at least uh, sort of a limitation on the expectations. I think it's it was really nice two years ago when the global biodiversity framework was was sort of settled. Uh, I think there are lots of of good uh, points, um, good uh, goals in in that framework, and then every country goes back home and. Uh, it sort of tends to become a competition of pointing on to everyone else. Uh, uh, like my country is not going to do anything. This is a global mm -hmm. framework, so everyone else is going to do this, but not we. Uh, and I don't know how to to deal with that. I would hope that you know getting together would sort of make some nations feel a bit ashamed of this, but unfortunately, I'm not sure. Um, if that will happen, Johan, <laughs> Johan, Asher, give me some positivity. Give me some optimism, please. Or are you both as jaded? <laughs> and uh, now I've I've done a lot of climate programs myself, and when 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 it's finished, I just me and the producer look at each other and we're like, oh. But what I'm also in the market for is climate positivity, if there is any. So, Johan, do you have any for me? Are you hopeful that COP16 will be able to do something? Well, on the positive side, I, I, I do support what uh, Gerardo said, is that it's good that people are getting together. It's, it's good that delegations yeah. are being sent from around the world to at least talk about this. It's good to have discussion. Whether it leads to anything, um, I also agree with the skepticism that has been expressed. But, you know, um, the crisis is deepening. People are being affected more and more. Politicians are being influenced more and more by their constituencies. And so let's hope as these COPs progress, they will kick into gear and the mechanisms of dialogue have been established. And at mm -hmm. least we do have a system for people to exchange ideas. Asha, I'm going to move it slightly on for yourself, actually, because, you know, we're talking about this framework and it's great that you mentioned it about the biodiversity one, Johan. But also recently there was the Global Ocean Alliance as well, led by the UK, consisting of 77 countries um, that effectively um, pledged to uh, conserve and manage 30 percent of the global oceans. Um, do you think that is something that's going to be upheld, something that's going to be uh, manageable to achieve? Yeah, so um, I don't know if we've all been on the planet for too long uh, and we've got a certain amount of skepticism about what, you know, these these big lofty targets, right? So so 30 mm -hmm. by 30 is something mm -hmm. that everyone talks about. It's sort of, it sounds nice, it rings well in your ear, right? But, um, you know, if we look at our progress, uh, we if you look at just the marine spaces, the goal was to protect 30% of the marine space by 2030. Um, we've gone, you know, since the start of the decade, we've gone from 8% of the oceans protected to 8.5%. So very, very slow progress. But the problem beyond that is it's not just about designating areas, right? It's not just about saying, oh, we've got 30%. That's awesome. It's how that's uh, uh, designated. Uh, who gets to manage these and also do they uphold um, sort of human rights, right? Uh, because a lot of these spaces sitting in the terrestrial areas, you have a lot of these spaces are indigenous protected areas. Um, are they being included? Are local communities being included? Are we considering all of the needs of the people? But also, you know, how is it managed? Like, if, you know, in many cases, there are uh, countries in like mine in Sri Lanka, where we'll have a protected area right on our you know, our doorstep, to, so to speak, just right in the water, right where you can walk into it. And it's very badly managed, right? So it's not just about saying, oh, we've hit this target. What are our implementing measures and how are we actually planning for the management so that these are effective? How are they designed? Are we making sure we're, collect we're covering representative sort of ecosystems and not just convenient ones, like an offshore um, marine protected area that's easy to designate because you know not a lot of work not a lot of human interaction happens there are we actually looking at the more challenging spaces where we need to consider protection right so so it's mm -hmm. a lot more complicated and i think it's important for us to keep that in mind i don't think it's a bad thing for us to try but i do think that it's a lot more nuanced just than just like the beautiful idea of 30 by 30 like let's get there yeah um johan 
you were talking a little bit there well, earlier when we were, when I was talking to you directly. We were talking about some of the ways um, to to help uh, keep uh, um, species alive and also you know preserve them. I wonder, is rewilding one of the solutions to protecting wildlife here as well from the impacts of climate change? I mean, given the increasing changing nature of our planet due to climate change, uh, has this also affected the definition of what rewilding actually is and whether one can recreate these ancient ecosystems? Well, rewilding means different things to different people. Um, the concept originated with the notion that many large mammals were extirpated at least partly anyway, through the actions of humans at the end of the Pleistocene era. And those large mammals had important functional properties in their rhythms, and those properties should be replaced. Now, the scientifically accepted definition of rewilding is the reorganization and regeneration of wildness in an ecologically degraded landscape with the present and future ecosystem function being of higher consideration than any historical benchmark conditions. We can't go back. So rewilding is now focusing on function and the future. The idea is to provide the essential functional types of organism to an ecosystem to allow it to function sustainably and produce ecosystem services. It's not anymore about recreating ancient ecosystems, which is just impossible. And, and I can talk about that in response to a future question. Mm -hmm. Gerardo. Yeah, I'd like to mention, I mean, when you say that we need to be, to give some hope, the hope is that we're here, the hope is we still have time to save the planet and most of the species, but we have to be very critical of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are enthusiastic about these COPs, things will be as usual. We need to change our mind. We need to understand, I, I hear something all the time, say, the cost of conservation is not the cost, it's an investment. It's like we have $10,000 in our pockets and we go to the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you need to pay the $200 to save your life. And I say, oh, wow, $200 is too expensive. We not understand that all the work that we need to do in conservation for saving the planet and for saving basically the conditions of the planet that make our life, in, uh, the life it make it suitable for life, the human life, for the conditions of civilization that we have experienced in the last few hundreds or few thousand years, requires a completely change of mind, requires mm -hmm. an, an, an investment in a different direction, in a different way, requires new organizations, new governments, uh, etc. But it needs to be, uh, uh, this change needs to be based on reality. What, is, what we are doing is not working. We're losing the battle. We're losing the species. We're losing ecosystems. We're losing the conditions of the planet to maintain life in general and to maintain human life in particular. And we don't have much time. We have probably two, three decades to really put our act together. So I'm very optimistic because this time because there is a lot of discussion because we are discussing and we're talking about the uh, proper issues, but I'm not happy with this kind of uh, international meetings that goes nowhere. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we need to be, I mean, we need to be clear on that, but I have yeah. full of optimism that if we put our act together, if we base our decisions on science, if we include the local people, if we help the poorer nations and so on, we can, we have a chance, but uh, uh, staying in the status quo won't work. No, absolutely. I, and totally understand what you're saying, Gerardo, and I think um, all of us here are in agreement. Um, for the last 20 minutes or so, let's turn our attention back to um, the focus of this um, talk tonight, which is all about whether we can prevent a sixth mass extinction. And I'd like to come to you. I mean, at the moment, when I put the news on and I'm, I'm hearing about the hurricanes in Florida and, and the incredible a force and power that we're seeing over there as well. And we know that because of climate change, we're also seeing more an increase in these extreme weather patterns, flooding, fires, droughts becoming more and more frequent. So to what extent is extreme weather disrupting the natural rhythms of wildlife, um, for example, such as migration, seasonal timings, and just the usual way and order of, of, of nature and biodiversity? I think, uh, I mean, both long-term trends and, and extreme events um, are affecting uh, wildlife in, in different ways. Uh, and it's not always super easy to, to separate it. Um, and 
I actually, I think insects serve as a, as a good example here again. Um, because, of course, they are ectothermic. They are dependent on the temperature around them. Uh, they are small, so they have short dispersal ranges, short lives. And a lot of their developmental timing is dependent on environmental cues. Um, and they have all these interactions with other species. So that's put together, um, makes them really sensitive both to temperature changes and to humidity uh, regimes. And saying how they will respond is of course not possible when there's a million different known species. But I think one thing that we need to be aware of is this risk um, of ecological mismatch, of things coming out of sync. Um, for instance, imagine if you know plants flowering needing their pollinators at a different point in time than when the insects are emerging uh, that will do this pollination or well if uh, you know the birds have the chicks uh, and need insects to feed them at a different point uh, than when the insect emergence is um, this is one of the really serious is issues i think um so maybe not uh, not your hope there, but uh, no, I think it's again. not all. It's, it's, it's reality. <laughs> so I think you know I was talking about the hope when it comes to COP, but no, we're talking about reality here. So we don't need to keep yes. referring back to that one. Absolutely. But Johan, I'd love to bring you in on this. And um, it seems to marry very well with what Anne was saying about the things not being in sync, and and particularly with with wildlife, that could, that is also a danger. Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, there are all manner of examples of species such as polar bears, for example, which are no longer able to go through their seasonal patterns of, uh, of hibernation and feeding. Um, there are examples of, for example, snowshoe hares that change their, their coat pattern uh, between winter and summer but the summer comes too early and then they're left with a pure white coat out in a, in a, in a brown patch of vegetation. Um, so there are many examples uh, where uh, wildlife in general, particularly um, in this case, including some large mammals, are becoming very vulnerable. Do we see that in the, in the waters as well, Asha? Yeah, so, I mean, we do see things like, um, you know, Let's go back to coral bleaching, right? You have coral, marine heat, extreme weather patterns, marine heat waves. You've got coral bleaching, structures breaking down, no nursery grounds for fisheries, uh, coastal erosion, because, uh, you know, coral reefs have, have always protected coastlines, right? So when they break down, then you've got these impacts of um, co increased coastal erosion. You might have strong wind and waves because of hurricanes and storms that will kind of increase sedimentation. Uh, the ocean is always sort of like churned up. Uh, so there's no settling. There's resuspension of sediment, um, you know, shifting currents, right? As a result, also, you'll see shifting currents, which can change the migratory pathways of different species, right? So, um, and then affect food availability because food that's traditionally been in a certain place might be shifted to another place. Uh, you get heavy rains, um, you know, pollution, pollutants washing out into the marine environment. So certainly, you know, there are lots of these effects that uh, can happen. And, and I mean, I think the important thing is, again, going back to the fact that it's not just one stressor, it's multiple stressors, but each stressor also has knock-on effects, right? So we're dealing mm -hmm. with quite a number of things. Um, and sometimes it is hard to tease it apart. And I know that's been talked about too. Yeah, what the, the thing that's becoming crystal clear for me from speaking to all four of you is just how much everything is interlinked. And yes, you're all specialists in your own certain areas, but everything that you do and everything that you're saying is matching what everybody else is. So that is, um, yeah, it's very enlightening, but it's also very worrying. The exponential effect of every single little thing is having on the world and on the planet. So with that in mind, and this is a question for all four of you, so whoever would like to go first, fantastic, thank you. But what is the best thing to do then objectively for wildlife? Is it just to leave things alone, let it be, or to restore ecosystems based on what idea, what our idea of, of a good natural habitat for those places is? I could jump in there and, and just say that 
we've reached the stage in the biodiversity crisis where we have to realize that humans depend on the natural mm. world for survival. So it's not about trying to conserve wildlife for the sake of having a, a natural system, the, you know, the way God made it, so to speak. It's a matter of survival. This is our life support system. And, and we, have to, we have to work on conserving not only the species, but the functions of those species that provide the ecosystem services that humans depend upon. Anybody else like to jump in on that? Yeah, I can, I can say, well, ecosystem services are all the benefit that you, humans, we get from the proper function of nature. And the proper function of nature depends on the species that are uh, interlinked in uh, systems we call ecosystems. And those functions are, for instance, ecosystem services is the proper combination of the atmosphere to have life on the planet, is the water availability, is the fertilization of all the soils in the planet, uh, is... Uh, 75, something like that, percent of the uh, uh, compounds, active compounds of drugs, of medicines right now, comes from uh, plants, animals, and microorganisms in the wild. Uh, 70 percent or more of our crops are pollinated totally or partially by insects and by uh, animals. Uh, so we depend. And there are many reasons to protect nature, philosophical, ethical, religious, whatever. The most important one, the most selfish one, is we need to protect nature and we need to protect the species to save humanity. If we have learned something about in the last previous five mass extinction, is unless there is a nuclear holocaust or something like that, life will continue. We will lose many species. We will lose many magnificent uh, creations of evolutions. But at the end, in 10 or 15 million years, life will recover. But the point here is, if we manage to maintain the conditions of the planet so we can have a, a, a stable civilization in the next few uh, decades and we can maintain humanity for more uh, centuries. That's a critical issue that we are talking about here. To slightly be contrary here, I mean, right at the start, I asked you about this, uh, Gerardo, and you said, um, we are the problem. And, you know, there are too many of us. Uh, on this planet, and we are we have, we're effectively damaging it. You know, we're we're causing this. So, if we want to protect nature for our own selfish reasons of survival, then aren't we actually harming wildlife more than in protecting it? Well, I mean, when I said at the beginning of the causes, I mean, there is, for instance, we are too many people. The the planet is finite, the space and the energy is finite. You know, so. Uh, but we are keeping on, on, we are keeping growing, and there is not a policy at the global level or in most countries about uh, uh, stabilizing human population, and that's some critical issue that we need to cover. We also discuss about consumption. You know, we need to change our consumption patterns, and uh, we need to use better technologies. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we do yeah, that, if we do things for humans, focus, then we can uh, help all our uh, animals and plants. Let me tell you something very quickly. The most important thing for me as a professional in my life is to protect as many species of plants and animals and microorganisms from extinction. But to do that, I need to work with the human dimension. And I also understand that in the human dimension, if we do this properly, we will avoid humanity to suffer tremendous pain and tremendous suffering in the future, in the near future, because of hurricanes, because all these changes that we are creating. We are creating it so we can be the solution too. That's the important mm. part of this. Asha, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this because we're starting to move into an ideological conversation now as well about our role, aren't we? Yeah, I think um, just from my perspective, a, a reminder that actually for a long time, we saw ourselves as very separate from nature, but that's actually not the case. We're part of nature, right? And I mean, if anything, like you say, like you just summed up a little while ago, we all talk about this interconnectedness, right? The subtleties of everything having knock-on effects, ripple effects, being interconnected. And so, yes, unfortunately, the way the human, you know, psyche works, we're all we're much more prepared to do something if it helps us. And that's, you know, that's just how we function as a species. And so, 
going back to focusing on like how important is for our survival is actually one of the key ways that we can start to move the needle forward. Um, I mean, I've met people who don't have that, you know, if you say, oh, we need to, you know, protect the whales, they're like, well, they're very out there, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but the services they provide out there are really important to our survival here. And then the minute you connect the dots, that's when they start to listen, right? And that's, that's just the general public. So I think it goes back to like, shifting the narrative again and re-reminding people that we're all interconnected, we're all at the same level, we're all na we are part of nature, we're not separate, it's not us against nature, that's really important to know. But then also acknowledging that um, we, have a, we have a lot to do, but a lot of that has to do with being able to communicate with people and making sure that everyone understands where we are, what we're doing, and why we need to do it. Mm. And your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, this is the reason why uh, IPES uh, and also the Global Biodiversity Framework uh, talks about the transformative change. I mean, it's it doesn't mean doing a little bit more of what we are already doing or doing a little bit less uh, of what we are already doing. It means transformation. And I think it's important to realize that, you know, business as usual is not an option that is on the table. Uh, because if we go on like today, uh, we will have, you know, some sort of uncontrolled collapse. Uh, while if we, on the other hand, go through this transformative change involving, you know, every part of society, including our values, um, our way of looking at nature, um, we can actually have a change towards uh, whatever you want to call it, a greener future, or a nature positive future. Um, in a sort of controlled way and I cannot understand why not everybody would want that. Uh, it seems very obvious that this is something we should at least, it should be easy to agree on the goal at least and then of course we, yeah. we have to discuss how to get there and that's what we are doing now for instance but still like we have been saying, why don't we get all the politicians on board on this greater Well, that's goal? what I was about to ask, actually. This, and this is a question to all of you, actually. But um, So is this then the role of governments to, to come together to set benchmarks in protecting species? Or is it down to us individually to look after our local areas and, and become better conservationists? Gerardo, I'll start with yourself on this one. Uh, yeah, I can say that, I mean, the complexity, we're talking about a, a problem that touches all the aspects of society, of the social, political, economic uh, issues in, in, in society at the global level. It's incredibly complex and nature is incredibly complex. So uh, the solutions, there should be as many solutions as possible. There is no such single solution. And the other thing I would say, I, I, I use three words to, to, to define it. We need to conserve. We need to conserve everything, not thirty percent. Everything that we can protect. We need to protect all the habitats and all the ecosystems that are still there functioning. We need to restore as many things as possible, and we need to adapt these three things. I mean, this should be the vision: conserve, restore, and adapt. And to, to give just one 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 uh, solution will be naive. I think. The more solutions, the more uh, 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 different actions, uh, uh, the better. So there are actions mm -hmm. at the family level, there are actions at the personal family, uh, a community, uh, state, country, and global level. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, all those actions together can start to give us uh, is, uh, winning some, some battles and eventually try to uh, win the war. Yeah, no, it's, it's fair what you say. It's not a binary choice, is it? It's all in that sense as well. Um, I'm going to come to some audience questions in a moment. And then before we leave, because we're almost at the end, it's been so much fun. I've genuinely really enjoyed it. And my mind has also gone like this. I'd love some final thoughts from you all as well. Um, but I'd just like to know, I mean, can any of you think of a, an example or so of a species that has come back from the brink of extinction um, or anything like that that you can share with me? Asha, you're nodding your head, so I hope hope you have a story. Uh, yeah, well, you know, um, whales being the charismatic species there obviously attracted the attention of people, you know, back in the 70s. And you can see how back whale populations today have uh, rebounded, right, uh, across the world. And I think that's a really important, I think it is, I mean, I, I'm glad that we're coming back to kind of this 
kind of hope spot this positive story because I think it reminds us of the collective power of humanity, right? Humans across the world decided that they were a species worth, worth protecting, you know, for whatever reason. And people stood up and they asked for what they wanted, they demanded. This led to moratoriums on whaling coming into place. This is, you know, there's so many things that happen as a result of the power of humans coming together. So the collective power of humanity is something that I think we need to, uh, we can't forget, but we also need to tap into because it can have, uh, it's a force for good. And that kind of connects back to your previous question. Is it for the governments to deal with or is it individuals? I think it, like uh, Harado says, right? it's like we all have a role to play. We can't sit and be complacent and be like, well, I want the planet to be protected, but I'm just going to sit here and continue with my life as usual, right? We have to all be comfortable to become, dis you know, to be in discomfort, uh, to kind of, you know, live lives that are, um, you know, more considerate of not just the present, but also the future. But it is possible. And like humpback girls are a great story of that, um, of how we can make that change. And I, I believe in the, you know, humanity's potential in this regard. And I think that's, you know, why we're all here. We all have hope, you know, as much as we might mm -hmm. be cynical or skeptical about certain things. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't think that I, I can, particularly me, can make a change. And with me, I can, you know, take others along with me on this journey to drive change. Yeah, whenever I get a little bit cynical, it's important to go out. And I was very lucky last year, no, the start of this year, no, it was last year in, in December, um, to be, to be able to go to the Salish Sea by uh, Canada uh, to see the humpback whales um, we, who have just come back in huge numbers. And that is something that will stay with me. And that is when you realise that, yeah, nature is incredible and, and just everything. And I'm that big compared to these things. So, yeah, 100% agree with you on that one, Asha. Um, on land, are there any examples um, maybe that you can share with us, Johan, of um, you know, a species recently coming back from the brink? Yeah, so I'm going to jump down to some of the less charismatic species, and I can talk about a, a genus of snail in the Partula genus. And here at ZSL, there's been work on this on the snail, which has been extinct in the wild for 40 years. Um, they come from the uh, French Polynesian islands, and they've been maintained in the living collection here um, very carefully. And now they've been returned to the wild where they were completely and utterly extinct um, and where they were very important in the food web in terms of converting plant material into detritus and recycling nutrients and then feeding into the feed, food web. And uh, a recent expedition from here, our colleagues, have now found these snails are breeding successfully in the wild and they're back. And uh, so that's a species that was extinct in the wild and it's back. Fantastic. I can't, I can't share any stories of actually seeing those snails, but, um, but I'm very glad that they are back. Gerardo, you wanted to add something? So sorry about that. I mean, bison, bison in, the, in, in North America. Bison were almost wiped out. They were one of probably the, large, the, the, the most uh, abundant a large animal mammal in the planet, 30 to 60 million uh, in the 1800s. There were fewer, a few hundred left. Uh, National Park uh, Yellowstone was created to save them. And now there are probably around 10,000 uh, in, in, in wild and uh, almost half a million in private reserves and ranches. So that's a great, uh, uh, in Mexico, we reintroduced them in 2009. Uh, there were 23 animals, now we have 400 bison. So there are many success stories like that uh, that give us hope. And as Asha said, we are here because we believe that we can change with our science, our actions, and we can contribute to, to the proper good changes on this. Fantastic. See, you, you guys aren't, you, you're not cynics. You're just calling out when you see things as they are. And we, we were calling out things before and now, and now we can see the hope here as well. So thank you for sharing those inspiring stories with me. Let's move on then with, um, with a few minutes left to some audience questions. And um, several questions have come in. Thank you to, to all those watching who have sent them in. Katerina has a question uh, from Chelmsford saying, is there a chance to revive new species that become extinct or are becoming extinct like the northern white rhino 
using DNA from the Biodiverse DNA Bank at the San Diego Zoo. Um, Anne, can I come to you on this one first? Yeah, I guess uh, I wouldn't be able to answer uh, sort of how easy or difficult that is in itself, but I would make an argument or I would at least raise a question of whether or not that is the optimal way of, of using our resources for conservation. Sure. Um, I tend to think that, like we have touched upon several times, we really need to work with habitats, with ecosystems, uh, with larger pieces of nature, uh, whether ocean or dry land, uh, and try to like Johan also has said, try to work with functional ecosystems, um, make it work on that scale. And of course, it is sad with those iconic species, but still, I think we need to realize it, it relates back to this. Um, these species are not there to be sort of beautiful or charismatic for us. Uh, we, we need nature. We need this complex interaction with lots of species. So that would be my answer. Mm, so it's not necessarily just about bringing these vanity projects back in, in laboratories, but actually seeing what we've got, nurturing and fostering that. Asha, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I very much agree. And I think, you know, bringing, it's not as easy as bringing it back and putting it in the wild because, you know, conditions have changed, right? So you're bringing something back that went extinct some time ago, you're putting into a modern environment. How does it fit in? So I think, you know, we talk about resources. Resources are so limited when it comes to protection of our planet. We struggle in different ways. Uh, not enough people are investing, as, as Haraldo would say, right? And so I think, we need to focus on what we have. We need to focus on how do we make, do better as in the planet that we're in with the species that we have and ensure that no more species go extinct in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Right, let's move on to our uh, to a, another audience question before I get some final thoughts from you all. Yan Hua from London says, how do we decide the right laws to protect wildlife and how can we speed up the establishment of these laws? Great question, um, Johan, and then Gerardo on this. Johan, why don't you go first? Well, I'm not a legal expert by any manner of means, <laughs> but I, I think ultimately what is important here is that voters take responsibility for using their vote in all the democratic countries around the planet to support their leaders if they have got sensible environmental agendas and to get rid of um, politicians and decision makers who are working against the environment. And ultimately, I think that is the most powerful way in which an individual person can influence policy. And it's, it's, it's really important that people stop being complacent, stop being apathetic, and realize that the, the crisis, that the environmental crisis that we're living in right now is a crisis that affects all of us, and it affects individual people at the family level. It's their, it's their kids, it's their grandkids that are at risk here. And start mm -hmm. taking it very, very seriously and using the democratic process. Okay. Gerardo, anything to add? Yes, that's a very important question. And I, I agree with Johan that probably the most critical thing that we can do as a person is our votes, voting for the uh, parties or for the individuals who have sensibility about the environmental issues. That's incredibly important. But then I gave you examples like in Mexico. In Mexico, we didn't have an Endangered Species Act in the 1990s. And I sit down with the advisor of the president and I say uh, in a very, I would say, well, very cynical way that uh, I say in Mexico, nobody has the power to enhance this important uh, uh, laws. And he say, what do you mean? He say, nobody. Nobody cares and nobody cares. He said, of course we care. Of course the president cares. Say, really? Okay, I'm not prepared, but this is a draft. And within six mm -hmm. months, we have a language speech. Out. So it's important. I bring these two questions because it's important that scientists start to participate in mm -hmm. 
getting into the public and getting to the politicians and so on. Uh, let me tell you very quickly that the, the president that just finished his term in Mexico was the worst president ever for the environment and for human rights and whatever. He was a really bad guy. But even though we managed to create, working with some of his people, three and a half million hectares of protected areas for jaguars and the biodiversity, that in Mexico since the 1970s, the new protected areas has to rel uh, rely on the local people, indigenous or rural people that own the land or private people to support the protected areas and it worked. So okay. basically we need to get involved. We need to work on that. Thank you so much, Gerardo. Right, so we've only got four minutes left. Four of you, one minute each. Is the sixth mass extinction inevitable or is there still a chance that we can prevent it? What's the most impactful thing that each of us can do to help save our wildlife? Asha, why don't you go first? Um, I, I uh, don't think it's preventable, but I think we can certainly do things to slow it down and to make slow it down enough to make better decisions along the way. Um, and I think that's really the important thing that we should focus on. I don't think, I mean, it'd be foolish for me to say we can prevent it. There's too many cogs in motion, right? And I know, as you know, interconnectedness, all these nuances. So I think, um, but I think we, I mean, personal action is really important. I think, you know, voting wisely is one, but then also what is your everyday, cons how do you consume in this world, right? Like what is your consumption mm -hmm. patterns? Are you being mindful of your, are we going beyond just ourselves? Um, I think that's really important. So there's lots of things we can do. The list is long, but I'll, I'll pass it on to someone else. Yeah, no, that's it. We know there's a long list. So for each of you, just one thing, that would be fantastic. And uh, Anne, go ahead, over to you. Um, well, to, to speak for the insects, I think there is hope if we start changing. The, the good news is, of course, that um, insects have a huge reproductive capacity. So they have a quite good uh, chance of bouncing back uh, if conditions are changed. Uh, and they are also small, so they don't necessarily need a, a large area. Even, you know, a corner of your own garden uh, will help a little. Um, uh, as Asha has been saying and others, I really believe in, um, in knowledge, in positive talk and enthusiasm. And I think we need to realize that how we talk about biodiversity, how we talk about insects and other small you know, creepy crawlies and, and species that we maybe not all of us think they're beautiful matters a lot. Uh, we need to take the time to get to know them, to realize that also these smaller species are actually, you know, not only bizarre and beautiful, but also vital to Listen, our lives. Please. Well said, thank you. Um, Gerardo, Johan, I know you both already started talking about it when you were talking about voting. So I'll give you both 30 seconds each on, on, on elaborating on something else. Gerardo, go ahead. There is hope. There is hope, first. Second, if we cannot stop the six month extinction, but we can mitigate it, you know? And uh, we have to become, people have to become actors and instead of being spectators, we have to become mm. actors on our life. And finally, we need to understand what is at stake is the future of humanity. That's the scope of the problem. Johan? Yeah, and I will just add that our, our children are the future and uh, we need to educate them well about the problem, the opportunities for mitigating the further severity of the problem, and then provide them with the skills and the opportunities and the technology to live sustainably with the consequences of this disaster. Thank you all. It's It's been lovely talking to you. I think it's safe to say that we could spend many more hours on this discussion about one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces today. And so thank you to all of you for joining me this evening and to all of you at home for tuning in as well. And also the Science Museum Climate Talk series continues with the next one taking place on the 27th of November entitled Can America Lead a Global Green Transition? You can book your free ticket by visiting the Climate Talk page via the Science Museum Group's website, where you can also check out the previous Climate Talks in the series. 
If you'd like to support the Science Museum Group across all five of their museums in the UK, which are free to visit and support their mission to inspire the next generation of scientists, technicians, engineers, mathematicians and medics, you can find a link to make a donation in the description below. It just leaves me to thank our speakers. They've been fantastic. They've been wonderful. And I've really enjoyed their company this evening. Anne, Gerardo, Johan, Asha, I really appreciate your time. And from me, Kasserol, a huge thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Good night.